start with Kirsten. Um, maybe Marco, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, at least I know you talked with Ed um, ah, okay. through the forum, but maybe um, just give a little history of where you stand. Uh, I know you were involved with uh, education as well. Well, e but by the way, I don't know, is, is this a sequel of a number of sessions? Is this a first session or? Is, uh, because, sorry if I'm not up to date. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have time to, to read other. Right, this, am, this I'm, will I'm, be. The only one who is new here? In, in a sense, um, oh, okay. <laughs> at, at least for, for Gidley, for Gidley, um, John, Ed, and I, oh, okay. have, we've okay. had two other cafe no sessions, uh, maybe yes. back in April. Okay, but this on education is the first one. Yes, correct. Or, uh, okay, okay, I, I understand. Yeah. If, if you're familiar at all with Rudolf Steiner and the Waldorf School, you, you probably are going to be very familiar with a lot of the things she talks about. Because she worked at, in that field for quite a while before she mm. went. Okay. Um, so, how to introduce myself? Well, uh, I'm from Germany. I'm living in Germany, actually. I was a teacher for not not very long, for three years, I think. Yes, for three years as a Walter uh, teacher in a Walter school. Uh, somewhere up there in the middle of Bav Bavaria and as a math and physics teacher had some experience w with that too I, but I developed my experience I think was almost in, in every range uh, of the educational system from schools, uh, university as a student, as a PhD, as a researcher and so on and developed uh, some ideas about education, which, uh, well, we may be able to, to discuss this also, uh, which go much in the libertarian, libertarian uh, um, educational direction. Uh, because, among other things, I was not very satisfied with the uh, Waldorf uh, system. Especially not not with his uh, his philosophy of Steiner's philosophy, which from uh, being a spiritualist, as, as you know, Doug, um, that's not the real problem. But uh, what I saw in practice, how his teaching have been put in practice, I, I don't I don't think this is frankly the future of education. I left the school. And I left also university because, frankly, I'm dissatisfied with the general notion of education of, that we have nowadays. Because I think it is a concept of education which is not only surpassed, it is at least a century year old. Technology has developed, has evolved, as everyone knows, but fundamentally, our school system and our education system didn't 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 change much. So that's why I'm very interested in this topic because I think we have to change fundamentally our ideas and our concepts about it and our preconcepts and and so so yes. Questions? Well, that, that aligns quite nicely with who Gidley is. Um, it, it also aligns quite nicely with perhaps nearly, mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of a few individuals on this site, like uh, Jeffrey Edwards, who mm -hmm. he's attended the Aurobindo Conversations, who has the same feel of um, higher education isn't exactly identifying the needs of what education, the, the term education is multifaceted. Mm -hmm. and, it's not going to be met within mm. one aspect. Um, perhaps Ed might feel the same way. I know he's he's had his own experience with the educational. Oh yes, I've had a lot of experience on both sides of the desk. Um, I'm in Germany as well, uh, down in uh, 
near Bad Hersfeld in the center. And this is where I originally started out in Germany when I got sent over here by the, the, with the army back in the 70s, early 70s. And I took a European out and I got a job teaching at a uh, Landerziehungsheim, Hermannliedschule in uh, Buchenau, uh, grades five to eight. And um, even though I had trained to be a, an English teacher in the United States, other than doing my student teaching, I never taught there. So I was teaching English as a foreign language and math, and I picked up a degree in religious education um, along the way. And uh, it, it was a very nice, it was a, it was a completely different exposure to education than I had ever been expo- had before because it was a, a boarding school. And one of the things, uh, Hermann Leitz, who was one of the reform pedagogists, or pedagogues of the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century, the whole idea was get kids out of the cities and get them out into nature and get them engaged in what they're doing. And so when, when he founded his schools, he actually had the children again. They built their own school buildings and they, they farmed their lands and they went to class. And they, you know, so everybody was involved, um, it was, which was nice because even though we were in, had a middle school group, we had two students had two representatives in the uh, faculty council who were voting members. So they were always involved in decisions. We couldn't do anything without, you know, getting along with the students. So we were kind of this little community all on our own and, and Leeds himself borrowed or yeah, he borrowed his pedagogy from uh, Montessori and, and Hertz and Hunt as a, Hand, hand, heart, head, heart, and hand. So Petzalazzi, sorry. Okay, so there we go. Sometimes the names don't come very good. And so we had, we had, we we taught classes in the morning, and uh, we lived in family groups. I had about between ten and fifteen students who lived in the same house with me. They were my family. Um, I was their family father, and my wife was their, their, you know, their mother because it was a boarding school. And then in the afternoons, four afternoons a week, they had to be in engaged in what were called guilds. So they learned hand type things. We had a pottery guild and photography and a carpentry guild. Uh, We also had one that was just called practical work, which I headed up for a while. So we just went around the grounds doing repairs and pulling fences back in the sheep pen and um, uh, fixing walls. You know, it was an old castle up in the top of a hill kind of things. And so there was this relatively integrated community of adults and children who kind of lived their educational there was it was hard to draw a line between well this was class and this was this and this was something else um what i found out when i when i left there after eight years and went back to the states for a number of reasons and my children were in an actual school uh, i never would have been able to teach in a school in the united states it was just it was too restrictive it was too much john uses the image a lot it was too much like a factory and so you just send them in and the presses go on and start punching out output. And then sooner or later, something comes out the door. And so it was, it was clear to me that at the turn of the 20th century, well, this is a good idea, but we need to do something about the turn of the 21st century that's coming up. And, and it didn't seem to me at the time that many people were thinking about that. But my life, unfortunately, or fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, took a turn. I went off and worked in engineering for 15 years before coming back to Germany. Um, but when I did come back, I ended up in a, um, at the DECRA Academy and DECRA is a big testing organization in Germany here. They do auto serve, they, they do all the car inspections and put stickers on the back. So you're allowed to drive them around, but they certify everything from teddy bears to, to nuclear power plants. And they had one, one of their subsidiaries was an academy and we did re-education uh, programs for unemployed individuals. So I got involved in, in vocational education and seeing what, what they were trying to do. In the last eight years, I was involved in European projects where we were working with partners from other European countries trying to find a better way to do vocational education. Because we have a lot, there's what, some aspects of the German system are brilliant. Uh, when, you, when you go through a, what's called a, a, a dual uh, training program, it has a lot of advantages because you do spend a lot of time doing practical things for practical work. There's a lot of hands-on kind of thing, some theory and some background. So, but it's almost impossible to translate that to other cultures 
even here in Europe, because they view they view students differently than they view vocational learners. They're, they're just you know, and they're kind of viewed like we we view students elsewhere, where they're kind of like objects of our teaching and our education. So we we, we tend to objectify. The, the kids that, and that's the part that always bothered me there was no nothing really personal enough about uh, education and I'm, I'm a firm believer that you can learn more in a not because I'm a grandfather now but I, but I was basing it on my grandfather I could learn more in an afternoon with my grandfather than I could in a week at school because just how he dealt with me and how we got along because of the personal interaction and and I'm a, I'm a firm believer in and I, and I saw this at the boarding school I was at. There were some kids that got on well with certain of the, of the staff, the instructors, and not well with others. And if they had more time to, to deal with each other across subjects, because I don't like that whole subject um, breakdown that we, that we generally you know, adhere to, um, they probably would have got, done a lot better educationally, not not only as far as like grades or marks or things were concerned, but what they would personally have benefited from because they were in an, an environment in and in a configuration that would enhance their own personal development. more. And we don't, I don't see that we have enough of that. Fortunately, when we were in California, I was living there. I saw public schools that had excellent teachers. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely excellent. teachers. probably the best teachers I've ever seen in a public school system. Of course, they're all old and retired now, and uh, so it doesn't look like that anymore. But but there are ways that even in a system like that, a lot of progress could have been made and was made. But fundamentally, I think something needs to change in how we understand education and what we do about education. Because I don't I don't think we educate people anymore. I think we just school them. If I could use that that term, that, that's what we do. But that's that's kind of where I'm coming from and why the subject even interests me. And of course, having having young grandchildren, I one. One grandson who's uh, about getting ready to go into uh, the, the Oberstufe, and I have two others who haven't even been there yet. So they're just starting out on the road, and it's going to be a long road to hoe before it's all done. Yeah. No, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I got my cup of coffee, but are we uh, talking about educational experiences? Well, yeah, or, we were just uh, kind of, you know, Okay. Marco's here for the like the first time in the cafe, and so he gave us a little spiel on where he's coming from and what he's thinking, and I just followed up on that because. Okay. And and Doug, you're, you're going to present something on Gidley, and then we're going to do it like an open conversation on it. Right. That, and and okay. if you have anything you'd like to add right now. Well, I would just. Yeah, actually, I do. Um, I've been thinking about this old lady all morning. She was a. Uh, uh, I guess I was in my my mid twenties and I was living in New I just, I've been living in New York for a couple of years and I was uh, uh, acting in a, I had an acting company downtown, lower Manhattan, where we were presenting plays. And during the day I had odd jobs. I worked in offices and you know, those uh, horrible, uh, you know, kind of temporary positions you have where you just float in and out as a receptionist or a, or a waiter or whatever. But I worked for this little old lady. She was a little old Jewish lady on the Upper West Side, right next to Columbia University. And she had been in the Holocaust. She had been a, a refugee, I believe. And she had come with her husband, a distinguished scholar, who I believe was a professor at, at Columbia. And she may have been a professor too, I wasn't sure. Um, but I do remember I would, I would work for her. I would, I would, do the shopping for her, light shopping, tidy up the place, um, you know, dust uh, her, her books. She had the largest personal library I have ever seen. She just had a gigantic apartment um, with lots of tall windows and just a, a book on every subject known to, to humanity um, was represented in her library. And she had these neat little stacks, sort of like me. Where I had little topics and themes, certain books that share a, a, a motif. I grab them and I put them in a corner and next to a lot of other little uh, little heaps of books. And uh, she did this. She, so all over the place, there these these little heaps of books. And she said, don't touch those. And she said it with a kind of tone in her voice, which meant 
really do not touch them. <laughs> so this is way before computers. We're talking about like no such thing as anything was on, on a computer. So uh, she had everything arranged that she was studying. And I think she was compiling something, I don't know what, um, for some res a research project. Um, but I remember one day I sat down and had tea with her. And, um, you know, she asked me questions about my personal life. And she was fascinated by the fact that I was a, an actor <clears throat> downtown with all of that, uh, the glamour that goes with that. You know, she was very fascinated by that. And she had, of course, come from, from Berlin, you know, back in the, before the war, which was a, which was a capital cultural capital um you know all over the world people went that to there for the for the the novelty and um i guess you would say the avant-garde uh energy that was there which you know sort of had was happening in lower manhattan at that time that kind of avant-gardeism um before it turned into gentrification and, and uh, the sort of bourgeois fantasy land that new york has become but i remember sitting in that chair and sipping tea with this gracious old lady and she just emanated her curiosity about me just sort of got me to talking way too much because <laughs> she was just so like open uh, to whatever was coming up and she has very gentle quiet questions but there was a uh, i realized that um you know my education i talked about the theater and my education which is pretty piss poor back in texas talking about factory model i mean we barely got the ABCs. Uh, we were raised to be stupid and to work in some something really stupid and dumb. And uh, you know, I had there were aspirations other places, and in the I found a peer group and I broke out of that. But it wasn't easy. Um, so I got out of Texas. But uh, I think my education really happened in the Lower East Side, um, in the theater, uh, and later working in gay as a gay activist and working with the uh, persons with AIDS and mobilizing around that uh, political struggle, which is still ongoing in some places. Um, but we had some tremendous successes. Uh, and I think the collaborative learning atmosphere at that time, which is rapidly vanishing, I think, with our devices and our computers, we just don't see face-to-face -face communication of very high quality in my, my from where I'm coming from. But that, um, I think that was really my education and in uh, in real 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 time with real people face to face mobilizing uh, finding directions out of all of the many different currents that were uh, flowing through us and um, and that's my inspiration for returning over and over again to these calls here at the cafe and um, the other kinds of uh, uh, study groups that have emerged. Uh, such as the one that we're doing with Life Divine, Marcus and that one, and, as well as Doug. And I think Ed has been a contributor on occasion. So I think this is where I'm interested in these kind of comp a comparative study of all of these, uh, these uh, different trends, um, which are, which, and I think you've all pointed them out. You know, some of the deficient mental structures are starting to rapidly crack and fall to pieces. And, uh, and here we are in late stage modernity and what's going to happen next and who are the people uh, who are going to be able to integrate what what's going on now and what are the the, the new subjectivities and the new, new metaphysics which are going to emerge um, from i think the people who are going to make sense of this and i think that's why we've all studied gebser many of us have studied gebser and some of us and i'm studying steiner now and um, I think, uh, uh, you know, Slaughter Dyke and Rabindo, I think um, the inspiration has been to, uh, let's look at those, those people who are integral or integralish or on the cusp of that, that late modern. Um, and, um, you know, use an as if, a magic as if frame to maybe cultivate certain trends and accelerate them if we can. In, in, in a more healthy direction. Um, so anyway, that's my spiel, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, but yeah, like you were saying, one of the reasons um, I think we all, all of us here feel drawn to Gidley is her meta-integrative work on 
familiar names on the, the site, on the internet conversations. Uh, I wasn't there for the Gebser, but she's really tied in Gebser with um, Wilbur and Steiner, along with Haro Bindo. And those, those four names right there continually um, play on repeat here at the site. Um, she also includes De Chardin, who we've um, mentioned a few times, Ed Explored, Benedictor. Um, I did too. And John. Um, and you say you're currently reading Steiner. I, I wouldn't mind. But I think the perception of Steiner, at least here in the States, is as a, a mystic or as some occult uh, presence solely rather than the, the dynamics of uh, his educational. And, well, it sounds like pretty much anything that he, you can name. He's uh, stuck his hand in or, or head or heart. Well, um, but Gidley essentially identifies uh, Gebser as the guide. Um, and Wilbur as the map maker. And uh, Steiner can be seen as the territory, one that kind of has explored all the different aspects there. Um, so she calls them the guide, the map maker, and the territory. Um, but if you were to give a term to Gidley, she, she would probably be considered a weaver. She identified herself at one point as we interweaving these complex ideas that have developed and well, all the way back quite a bit, but she really focuses on 19th, 20th century. And she herself is into uh, future studies, not necessarily the techno utopian type of futures, but more of the complex issues that we've all identified here, um, kind of uh, getting a, a step up on um, making better decisions. Um, for these complex futures, but I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. Um, she also identifies herself as uh, she was a psychologist, uh, professionally educator for quite a bit in the 70s. Uh, she began her own Steiner school because like Marco was saying, um, she, she wasn't identifying well with the conservative side of the Steiner schools. So she wanted to open it up to um, what she was reading at the time in Steiner. She wanted to reopen kind of his philosophy within his own Waldorf school that was kind of possibly manufactured along the way to fit a certain uh, mainstream um, educated aspect. Um, but currently, She's focused on futures research. Um, as mentioned, I, I didn't have a chance to piece all this together. Busy fellow, but um, I think we'll have a good conversation as we are. Um, so I'll continue. And I think John and Ed might be able to talk about Italy better than I can. But um, so what she means by post formal education. We've identified already. It's essentially what comes after that that factory model of education. Um, she identified in one of the papers um, kind of three waves that have um, of educational impulses uh, since the beginning of the 20th century that um, contribute to the evolution of education into the post formal um, kind of ideology. But she, um, she notes the first wave is we've identified Rudolf Steiner, the Waldorf school, schools, Maria Montessori, and the Montessori schools. Um, Arobindo, she identifies Arobindo and mothers work at the ashram, the integral yoga education um, that they develop as um, crucial or as a, a, a new wave. Um, coming through. Also, she identifies Whitehead and Dewey um, as pioneering more integral and organic educational approaches. Um, I'll read a quote about these. She says they emphasize the imagination, aesthetics, organic thinking, practical engagement, 
creativity, spirituality, and other features that reflect the emergent integral of consciousness. These educational pioneers were also futures oriented in that they also subscribe in some way to evolutionary notions of consciousness, culture, and even cosmos. Um, however, these programs have been marginalized, or in the case of Dewey, um, they've been reduced to um, by the mainstream system in so called progressive education. So that's the first wave there. Hello, Katina. Okay, you're able to hear us? All right, good. Um, fun. We kind of introduced ourselves a little bit ago. I'm about halfway through a brief, uh, unstructured presentation of uh, Gidley. Um, we're going through three kind of educational waves in the 20th century that she identified as uh, kind of leading into the post formal uh, educational aspects. So the first wave was um, the turn of the 19th century. With Gebser, Aravindo, Steiner, uh, Maria Montessori. Um, then the second wave she identifies as um, around the 1970s, the an alternative education um, can be seen as the counter counterculture here in the U.S. and maybe worldwide. Um, but it, it, it focused on alternative modes, such as more focus on homeschooling, holistic education more critical pedagogy, futures education. Um, but she says that these didn't necessarily honor the spiritual needs uh, or the multi-layered nature of the developing child. Um, they're, they're still just little aspects of each, um, of what can be, it's not fully integral. Um, and then the third way she identifies uh, the post-formal pedagogies. Um, she ticks off a list here, uh, maybe a few, but aesthetic and artistic education, complexity in education, critical post-colonial pedagogies, environmental, we've noted, uh, futures education, holistic, imagination and creativity in education, integral education, planetary global education, post-formality in education, post-modern and post-structuralist pedagogies, um, and even into the spiritual, contemplative, and uh, wisdom in education. So they're all kind of small streams that we all recognize and maybe the, the Waldorf school, or we recognize the nature and, um, and the focus on creativity and Montessori. Um, but there's something missing. There's, there's not just the complete um, education, which perhaps there cannot be. Um, um, um. Debating whether to go into the book all that much, but um, I'll at least go into what she means by complex futures. We've loosely identified uh, now that um, that this is a complex world we're living in um, to cater to all of our needs, or even to cater to the individual is near impossibility. But um, one of the main traits of being human is to be able to reflect and act upon our futures. Um, so in an unknown world or ever-changing, uncertain world, uh, we have this need to know, we, ha we have this need to make what is unknown or implicit and explicate to, to make certain our futures. Um, so things like science, technology, allow us to predict the futures. Um, and also, uh, literature, philosophy. Uh, we, we've explored science fiction here with Octavia Butler's Parables series, which is a dystopian type of novel, novel maybe a forewarning of the, of the future of what could happen. 
uh, in America if it proceeds the way it's going. Um, so all, all of these are ways to reflect upon the future um, and kind of give us fodder for our place and time and space as how to proceed. Um, Gidley sees this, or the complex futures as more pressing as many of us have noticed there's quite a bit of going on globally. Uh, we have climate change, um, just, just the integration of knowledge worldwide on a global scale. Um, and I, I mentioned Butler and dystopian literature, but there, there seems to be more and more dystopian perspectives in, in our writing than ever before. Perhaps it's because there's more writers, but um, that may be a reflection of the world we're living in. Um, and how do we proceed? It's, it's tough to determine how to proceed. So since we live in this complex world, um, we need to reflect upon some of our greatest minds. Um, and that's essentially what Gidley is doing here. It's not necessarily just the greatest minds, but those that, like John is saying, put their heart into the one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, that put their souls into their work and not just because this is what was put on paper as what I need to do. Um, so we need more people to be actively involved in futures um, in present time, in real time, not, not necessarily. She, she seems to have a gripe, and I know John and uh, Ed both have a gripe against these techno-utopians who um, believe that Technology will be the future, will be what saves us in the future. Um, but someone like Gidley, when she thinks of the future, she's thinking of a human-centered approach and going from there. There might be technology involved, but essentially it's going to be the, the minds, the hearts, the souls, the bodies um, that are doing the work. So without going into her book, which I, I hope to do at a future time, I hope to have maybe some, even if we don't do a cafe on it, I might um, just put together a presentation. So to give a better summary of the book, which uh, if you know me, I'm, even if I prepare for weeks and weeks, years and years, I still feel um, incomplete. So I tend to be jumbled, but um, let me try this. Screen sharing. All right, so this is essentially a distillation of the entire book. Um, it might be hard to understand, and I, I won't be able to do it justice um, nor answer questions, but essentially each theme, if you look at the center, it says post-formal education philosophy. Um, so if we go with theme one to the, the right, she, she begins with the pedagogical love, um, which she identifies um, dialectical reasoning, higher purpose, and integration. Uh, theme two, life, is futures reasoning, imagination, ecological reasoning. Up at the top, the pedagogical wisdom, she identifies with complexity, intuitive wisdom, creativity. And on the bottom is voice which is language, re reflexivity, reflexivity, and plural, pluralism. Um, and I apologize for not knowing exactly where to go with this. I, I had a lot to say, but uh, right now my mind is not working properly. So if anybody has any comments or anything they'd like to say, I'm going to browse through my notes for a bit. But. Uh, yeah, Doug, uh, I, I'm, I don't know her, um, but the links that I received were mostly 
folk, uh, at, at least those <laughs> I clicked, there, there were so many, probably I was not very lucky, but uh, I heard her, her speaking almost exclusively only about the futures reasoning. And I was going to take a bit of critical stance because I said this is too restricted for my uh, my taste at least. Now I'm, I'm very pleased to see that there is all this universe that goes much beyond that. Uh, why is it, however, that at least in those, have I been unlucky to see always her papers and videos which were so focused on this futures reasoning or is it really her focus or does it also go beyond that? So I, I would state that's her most recent focus. Um, I can't remember yeah. her, her actual title within um, her, her profession, but um, she essentially is within a futures department future studies. So recently uh, she's been focused on that. Um, but no, uh, her whole life, she's been kind of combined this, this book, this post um, formal education and uh, uh, complex futures is essentially a combination of what she's done throughout her life. But yeah, all the talks I found online um, are really focused on the, the future studies. But. Yes, it's, but it's really, really a pity because, I mean, I'm not against futures reasoning and education. That's wonderful. I, I appreciate this very much, but I see that there, fortunately, she has a much wider uh, uh, view that should be emphasized, I think. Uh, okay. th does she speak this about, uh, write about this also in her, her book, Post Formal Education, or is, is it also so well, focused? I think I can answer some of that, unless Doug, you want to go for that. Um, she wrote a paper, which we all studied, or many of us on this call did. Is Marco here? Marco Morelli? Is he the Cosmos host? I just no, see that, that was me logged in. Okay, so, wait, so Marco's not here today. Okay, Marco was here at that one. Um, and we had several discussions about this paper, um, Planetary Futures. And um, I we read that, and I also read her her book on futures, uh, a short book on that, intro on that topic. And I also read this um, course from education. So I think she, uh, just to capsulize some of this, um, she's talking, as you say, about the uh, human-centered approach. And um, she does focus on Gebser, who provides structure to become conceptually oriented. Gebs is very good at structure. Steiner does the deep dives into the spiritual wisdom. Wilbur provides lots of maps uh, about uh, the integral. And I think those three are the ones she focuses on in that paper that we studied. Um, she did make some reference to Aurobindo, which was why many of us were motivated to let read Aurobindo, uh, and which we, we, we have been doing last six months or so. Um, but she does say, I think she, she sort of summarizes that paper. She says there, there's a major tension in adequately communicating insights into the complements of an emergent consciousness. And all of these writers are talking about an emergent consciousness. She says the two poles of this tension are the struggle to be accurate and authentic to the voice of the new facts. And the other is the desire to be understood by a worldly context that is insufficiently familiar with what is being communicated. So I think a lot of folks feel this tension. Uh, they've had anomalous experiences or woo-woo experiences or weird stuff that uh, or paranormal events that have occurred to them or synchronistic events of a very ordinary nature. It doesn't have to be dramatic. Sometimes it is. But these kinds of anomalous experiences add up and... Uh, demonstrate in a very you know visceral way that what we've been taught isn't the truth that there are uh, that there are other kinds of uh, possibilities that can be actualized than the ones that we get in our factory model educations and I think uh, she 
points out that uh, in the con and I'm quoting her, in the context of our only planetary home, which is in crisis, it is vital to emphasize life enhancing metaphors rather than mechanistic, technist or digital metaphors. So I think that's a, a heroic challenge um, because we're just di digitalized to death. And I wanted to share something, this is personal, but I think it's also transpersonal. Um, this is also, I believe, um, I, I uh, had this experience last night in anticipation of this call. And I had spent yesterday studying quite a bit. And I think, uh, and, but, but I had a poignant moment when I found out a friend, someone that I had known, um, I, I read an obituary on him, someone that I had known back in the 80s and the 90s, I knew him well. We were very, we were colleagues and we were activists together and we were very involved in a lot of uh, communal activities uh, to put forward certain political agendas, but also cultural and aesthetic agendas as well. He was a very gifted person, but a very difficult person. And I've lost touch with him. Um, I hadn't seen him in about 10 years. And then I realized, I found this obituary because I had this curiosity about what happened to Kevin. And then I found his obituary and that he had died five years ago. And um, I saw his picture when he was a young man and I felt a, a, a flow state, a very oceanic experience of uh, that sublime kind of otherness. Um, and he was, uh, I realized in his personal life, he was very troubled and very difficult, um, very gifted. Uh, and, but there was something else about him because we don't really know anybody at all, really. There's, there's levels of a person that are so vast that we, even people that we think we are very intimate with totally uh, evade us. And this was certainly with, true of him. So with these feelings, um, I went to bed and I had a dream and there was these, uh, there was these two, two beautiful gay men in a kitchen together having a conversation. And then I all of a sudden felt this wave of like, what is this weird feeling I'm getting? And then I, and then I collapsed on the floor. I had a vivid recall of my first lover when I was 19 years old, who died of AIDS. And, I, and that feeling of uh, deja vu um, with this, watching this beautiful young couple before any tragedy has come. And then I find myself uh, waking up with a terrified feeling. And then I soothe myself with my dream yoga, my practice, we've all been talking about different dream yoga practices. And then I found myself uh, following Vajrayana practice, a yoga practice where you work with the energy centers. And I felt that it heated up, the system was, the entire energy system started to warm up. I felt a, a golden light, but it wasn't too it wasn't too intense that I blew a fuse. I was able to sustain my attention rather than get caught up in the excitement of the flow. And then I lifted up, 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 and into another dimension. And I was sitting around a table, a conference table. It looked very ordinary, actually. And I was, and I, the people I was discussing, I talked to these people about. Well, you know, I'm able to use these, these ancient Tibetan practices where I can uh, move the energy up and down my spine. I was, and I was at this point totally lucid. And um, I said, and I also, this probably has something to do with the fact that I had past lives in, in China and in Japan. And then I shifted to another kind of space where I was looking at something uh, hard to put into words. Um, and all of this is a translation I'm trying to make, but there was something that, and I remember asking in English, it looked like different, different scripts and different languages that I couldn't speak. And it was all scrolling from a top, top down. And I would sometimes be able to pause something and try to read it, but uh, it, uh, it was almost like I was dyslexic and I, the, the, the uh, script got very bizarre and I wasn't able to really, but I was able to, something emanated from it that was, information and I thought well is this the Akashic records I'm looking at what is this and then everything turned into a flat screen and there were lots of little composite faces looking like you guys right now <laughs> except the whole screen was just full 
and I got a little alarmed uh, when I woke up because I got the feeling that this flat screen technology is hijacking my nervous system. And um, that was the question mark that continued as I returned to the, to, to the conventional physical parameters, you know. Um, and I believe that I believe that I'm trying to track um, this integral phase, what it could be like in this late modern, postmodern um, mental deficient phase that all of us are trapped in um, with our factory model educations and the make the big bang for the biggest buck, whatever, you know, we're all like caught in this, uh, this money, money crazy world. And what would it be like to move towards a post-money, post-capitalist, um, post-modern? Um, what would the metaphysics be? What would the subjectivities of the persons be? Um, how can we pay attention to the monophasic and the polyphasic? How can the polyphasic be brought forward so that we can still have linear time, but we're not dominated or trapped by linear time? And I believe we're working on this. I think in, in many of our cafes, we've gone over and over some of this material. And um, I think, and also uh, I've been working with, with Katina and Doug and our, our friend Michael. We have a small group where we're really focusing, I believe on a, on a project that's, can we reflect upon our language? And uh, I think it's a, uh, I think that was on her list of uh, under voice, under language, self-reflection, post-structuralism, there was something else she pointed to as, as under, connected to the, to, the, to the expression of the voice. And I believe that uh, many of us here are, are drawn to language and to the study of poetry. I think um, a brilliant dis a demonstration of this has been recently with uh, Heather and Jeffrey and Marco Morelli, who did their presentation together, working with quantum poetics. So I think this is a, a demonstration of this uh, trend that we're trying to cultivate. I think it's it's risky and we're borderline Tower of Babel. Um, so I believe uh, it really requires a certain amount of vigilance to um, maintain, study those boundaries um, and um, the boundary conditions and uh, taking deep dives rather than staying in the surface level chat, comfortable chat fest zone that I think is encouraged by our, our digital technology. And I think some of us are taking those deep dives and we do need to practice how to articulate um, and how to translate adequately once we've made those deep dives. I don't know that R Rupert Steiner succeeded. I think he was poisoned, some say. He died, I think, when he was 64. Some people say that he, speculate that he may have been poisoned. The last year of his life, he had some mysterious disease. By poisoned by some um, someone in one of the factions that were against him, and he had he had some enemies, many enemies. Um, and uh, you know, Gebser in the pictures that I've seen of him did not look like a healthy fellow. He looked pretty beat up. <laughs> so I'm just saying that uh, uh, the, the visionary types among us, you know, have a hard time. I think the the greatest difficulty is is trying to articulate something in in a worldly context where people are basically out to, um, you know, privatize their privilege and to project to the public their pain. Um, so I think that's the tension, I think, that many of us are sort of feeling that we can do better than this. Um, so anyway, that's the reason that I shared that, uh, I think it's borderline visionary. There's a lot of psychological, personal stuff. But I think, um, I think each of us can bring forward uh, these, uh, from these other areas of our, you know, cognitive, affective uh, experience and coordinate and translate and do this much better, probably than we need to do it better than we've ever done before. Right now it's a, it's a total mess. And so I'm just saying just a few good people, if we could just model very carefully with using clean language, of the symbolic landscape that they bring forward, I believe we would have um, 
an opportunity for doing some really interesting creative research. And that would be my hope for the next phase of, of my involvement here with this, uh, with this very uh, competent group. So thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, you're not you're not necessarily looking gaunt, so hopefully your visionary tendencies aren't going to lead you to starve yourself or anything like that. Um, well, well, sometimes it takes me days to recover. I mean, in these subtle experiences, uh, I sometimes sleep up to t afterwards uh, twelve hours a day, and um, can be very disorienting trying to integrate. I don't think we've done a very good. Uh, I think we conflate um, meta perspective with integration. I don't think taking a meta perspective is the same thing as integrating. And more on that later, but I think that's a something that I've learned as I, I've learned today from reviewing Gidley's paper and from reflecting on the Aurobindo experience. But I think we need to, that's a question that I'm holding, holding the tension. Thank you. I've always questioned to the the multiple screens that are in front of me right now, and um, occasionally, what am I doing here? I, I could be physically out in the world exploring, or um, going to think of ideas for my children, or spend more time with my family, or spend more time on whatever else. But, um, yeah, what we're doing here, I, I really feel, isn't just taking on various meta perspectives and shooting them out uh, willy nilly just to get our ideas out. Um, when we're coming together at our best, we we really s seek to understand each other's perspectives to integrate what we said, um, and just to see where it takes us, um, consciously in a lot of ways. Uh, I, I would like to attempt another uh, introduction to the book. Um, if anyone else would like to make a comment, I know, Katina, if you're available, you haven't had a chance to speak up, but I'd like to hear your voice. <laughs> You're on mute at this time. Yeah, I've just been listening so far um, to what everyone's been saying. And um, yeah, like Marco was saying, when I looked at some of the links, uh, I saw, I thought she was just going, focusing on one particular aspect. But then um, I sort of went off and did other little searches on her stuff and found that, um, yeah, a lot of what she was saying was music to my ears. But it, I mean, a lot of what she said didn't really have to be applied to like a, a futurist type of philosophy. I mean, this is this post formal philosophy, especially the pedagogy of love being at the center of it is something that that educators called educators have been called have been asking for for a long time. And um, and I know what John was talking about, uh, you know, about the uh, emphasis on on the economy and, and wealth in this country. She, she addresses that in her book. Um, uh, and, but she addresses it and that, you know, in a, she, she doesn't really take it as far as I thought she would because she addresses it and in a way of sort of uh, setting it as, you know, making it the setting for, you know, the current setting. This is where we are now is, you know, um, a lot of the cynicism in our culture and lack of empathy um, that we have, which she relates to the pedagogy of love, um, is related to the the culture's overemphasis on on wealth and on um, and on you know uh, balance in the economy. That that's pretty much the only you know the only thing we really strive for culturally. Um, but I think that I thought she was going to take that in a direction by saying that um, that that we should completely change the whole motivation for educate for for education because i know when i was growing up the motivation for education was uh to get a good job 
you know, education was always a means. And I always felt like it's an end in and of itself, you know, but it's always been promoted as a means to, uh, to your survival and to thriving and to, you know, it's always been, it's always been connected to economic survival. You know, that, that's when it's never been promoted as just a, a, a virtue of good in and of itself, apart from what, what it can get you or, or where it can, uh, what you can accumulate or acquire as a result of it. It's never been promoted that way. Even when you hear teachers, you know, that are well-intentioned talking to their students, their high school students, uh, trying to motivate them about college and higher education is always, don't you want to get a good job? Don't you want to do this or that? And, you know, it's, it's beyond that. And I remember when I, when I, you know, I had to learn for myself in high school, you know, that education was a good in and of itself. And I remember when I was studying philosophy in college, I got so sick and tired of people asking me, what are you going to do with it? You know, what are you going to do with philosophy? And so I'm thinking, man, that's the main question is, you know, you go to college to find out, to, you, you go to college to acquire a degree or knowledge to see what you can do with it, um, what you can get with it. And um, and so I think that message just needs to be changed. And, and I like I thought she was going to go in that direction by saying, you know, we need to change the message or the motive for, for, I, for education, not just linking it to a job or to your survival or, you know, but linking, but it's just a good, it's a good in and of itself, you know, in that way. And so when I actually like went through and read some of the abstracts from her book, yeah, this is what, I mean, remember we had that move for the, you know, for teach for the teachers, for the educators, when you, if, you, if you taught in public school, remember we had this big move, we always had these big waves and these trends in education, um, where we were trying to teach character education in the schools. I don't know if any of you remember that. Um, it was in the public school system, um, and they wanted us to, and I was so excited. I was like, yes, finally, character education. And then it was literally just like a flash that just went away, because I was you know, developing a curriculum for character education. And, and then they came along and like she says about high stakes, uh, stakes testing. Oh no, we don't have enough room in our curriculum for that because uh, we need to focus more on, you know, stand, the high stakes testing and the uh, standardized testing. Um, so let's scratch character education for, let's just throw that out the window because it doesn't in any way apply to our bottom line. And what discouraged me when I started my master's in special ed, I went right into a second master's program in educational leadership but as soon as I saw as soon as I saw what it entailed that it was all about that you know of the what I don't know 60 credits you have to take like two-thirds of the credits were based on budgeting you know school budgets and economics and um, grant funding all of this stuff and none of it and I thought wait a minute so educational leadership is more just about balance, balancing a budget it's not and I was like, screw this. I'm not, uh-uh. I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to waste my time learning about that. Because I just thought that, that was just, I thought it was something more fundamental, <laughs> you know, um, than just balancing, a, than just balancing your school budget. And so, so even on the administrative level, that's what they're like, that's what the leader, if the leaders in the schools are being like, are being pressured to to look at the domain of education as a place where that has to be well-funded. We gotta be well-funded before we can do anything. Um, you know, then that's gonna trickle down. And that's one of the reasons why I left public, public education as, a, as an educator as well um, and went to private education. So, I mean, yeah, I, I totally agree with just about almost everything that she says in her book, but I don't really, I, I, I don't know what it has to do with futurist philosophy because I don't know. I, that, that's where I, I, I think this is something that's, I think it's timeless. A lot of the themes that she brought up, I think it's something that, that should have been around for ages, you know, but I do love how she was prophetic. And she, cause I remember I had a, one of my um, education professors at William and Mary say this like years ago. And he said that the few, it was, it was the history of American education class. And he went over all the different themes and everything. And then he says, the future of education is going to entail well, first of all, we're going to get rid of teachers. Instead of teaching, you're going to be called a, 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 a facilitator, right? And then she uses that same terminology in her book, you know, that teachers are going to be replaced with educational facilitators. And I don't know that I like that, you know. Uh, and, and then one last question is, uh, okay, 
Now, with the implementation of, of technology, you know, we really do have to be careful about how much technology plays a role in this development uh, of education and the, edu- in the future of education, because we see now how when, when Kurtzwell came along and the assistive technology and when, you know, when, ed- when technology came into the schools, because I taught before technology was there, or right when technology was coming to the schools, and it was a big craze. I, I, that's when I started teaching. Um, and I've noticed that students have actually gotten dumber since technology has, uh, you know, and, and if we're thinking, that, but yet we still think that technology is in some way going to enhance or improve our information processing skills or the way that we, um, or, 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 or our faculty, our cognitive, but no, because I haven't seen it happening at all. Um, that, 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 this is thing called undercover high school, this thing where like adults go in undercover as high school. And I mean, the, the, that didn't interest me. What interested me was that um, looking into what the, the 21st century classroom looks like in a high school, because like I said, I haven't taught in a classroom in a long time. And I saw, and the, and <laughs> the, this, the adults, the undercover high school students, they were like, they marveled at the fact that every student in that classroom was on their phone, engaging in social media, while the teacher was up there, like going over who knows what, and the principal left it up to the teacher's discretion as to whether or not they could bring their phones into school. And so uh, the well-intentioned teachers were like, yeah, go ahead and bring your phones into the classroom because there are all kinds of wonderful educational apps out there that I want to implement. Apps, yeah, right. There were no apps being used, okay? Kids were like t- YouTubing their friends at another school while the teacher's up there, you know, prepping them for the SATs or the, you know, the SOLs or whatever. And I mean, no one was paying attention and the teacher was okay with that. That would have been my worst nightmare as a teacher (laughs) for that to be happy. I mean, but that's, that's, that's the trend. That's the pattern. And so again, you bring uh, technology into the classroom with these apps, this whole BYOT, bring your own technology, whatever thing. And what it's doing is it's distracting students mo- even more from the content. Um, they're not becoming independent learners, okay? They're not, it's what they're doing is they're losing, they're losing their, um, their interest in learning, you know? And they're becoming these pseudo self-taught young people, you know, but they're not teaching themselves anything because they're not receiving the, 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 the uh, foundation or the, or the content to be able to process anything to teach themselves, you know? So I don't think that, so that's what I wonder about is, you know, we might have to get a little bit old fashioned when it comes to the future of education because I don't see technology, I haven't seen technology do a darn thing, except for maybe in special education, the assistive technology resources, yes, they do enhance, you know, a child's access to curriculum. But other than that, that, and that's what I'm wondering about, so. Sorry. Sorry for taking so long. Yes, if I may say, I completely agree. And it fits 100% also my my personal experience as a teacher, this, this thing with technology. Now, in Germany, we are obsessed. There's this obsession yeah, of digitalization of schools, and 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 the, the the young generation must be prepared uh, to the com- new global challenges coming up with uh, computers and artificial intelligence and this and that. And uh, I'm, I mean, I'm not against computers in school. Of course, the children and pupils should learn these techno- to 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 use these technologies. But uh, our government is now uh, spending billions, billions of euros uh, uh, to that every school has a uh, um, Wi-Fi, um, high-speed broadband, and and children in the young age must have uh, tablets and be able to use smartphones. And the, but I, I completely agree that there. I my impression that the more uh, children and students, I mean, also teenagers, use this technology, and the more they are unable to learn by themselves. That's that's what I noticed. Uh, they need something out there that tells them what to do, how to do it, when to do it. Uh, 
And the more they use these technologies, the less they are able to uh, uh, go for an independent research. And that's something our society, at least here, I would say, in my country, I don't know if it's, but I suppose it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon, uh, that many educators, I, I don't talk, I don't talk about politicians who uh, I even don't mention, but uh, also many pedagogues, modern pedagogues, seem not to be aware of this, because many professional um, professors, pedagogues, pro professors in the university, never teach in schools. Uh, they don't have they don't have this this understanding of this vision through a direct experience. Huh? Uh, and they talk about something that does not exist in the real school or a learning process that they idealize, but then cannot be uh, put into practice in the schools with the given uh, um, conditions that we have nowadays. And that's also a, a very, uh, strong critics that I make also to Steiner because Steiner as such had also a, a quite good, I mean, for okay, it's a matter of taste. Some like him very much, others don't like him at all because if you're, of course, if you're a diehard materialist, physicalist and don't believe in anything that goes beyond matter and the brain, you will certainly not appreciate <laughs> Steiner because he had also this spiritual vision uh, anthropos uh, of anthroposophy uh, uh, where the human being uh, is not only a physical being but also a spiritual being. He subdivided in, it into the astral body, in the ethereal body, in the eye, uh, ish, uh, as, suppose in English it's translated in the self. And um, he had this spiritual vision and uh, had this idea that education must uh, f uh, be acted on all these levels, not only at the brain level. Huh? So in this sense, I like him. But when you look how these things are put into practice, uh, it doesn't work. Not because the theory as such is wrong, or, but because the uh, frame and the uh, physical, um, uh, the surrounding, um, I, don't, I don't know how to translate this in English, but um, the given structure, institution that you have, after all of Walter schools, from this point of view, uh, are just, Almost, I, I, well, okay, I don't want to overemphasize this, but from this point of view, they are almost as every normal school. Uh, so they don't allow you, uh, paradoxically, world of schools don't allow to put in practice uh, uh, Steiner's ideas uh, because you don't have this possibility as a teacher to put this. And this is, I saw a general problem of most of the schools that we have ideals, uh, but we forget how, what kind of conditions, practical conditions, also very material conditions, uh, uh, organizational conditions, we should implement so that these ideas can flourish. Uh, and nowadays we speak about the independence and uh, of, of, uh, of, of children to learn by themselves, by independent um, they should develop themselves they I heard for example that, that we should listen to the spiritual needs which is for me I think but what is what should education be and, and here I come to the motivation in education what should education be for <laughs> we, we almost every time forget to uh, speak about that because probably unconsciously there is this reactive thinking that oh, well, education is there to prepare you for the coming world, uh, for the future. 
Yes and no. Yes, it is, of course, I sh it should prepare me for, to, for, for life and for, also for, for my job, but it cannot be all that. That must be much more. And education can mean, uh, there must be another emphasis. And for me, education, then the word educa educare uh, comes from the Latin uh, to take out, uh, to develop out, uh, educare, to um, pull it out. Pu pull out, pull out something. Pull out. <laughs> yeah. So the question is what should we pull out? Uh? My answer, my personal answer is to pull out the needs of the soul. Education should, should be a development of my individual soul. Uh, Sri Aurobindo would be, would say the psychic being, but call it whatever you wish. And, um, and this is completely lacking in our understanding. We need not only theories and philosophies, which are fine, but we need also the structure that allows to put in place these philosophies. And, this, and here, I, the discussion I, I see is completely lacking, as is almost absent. So that's my contribution now. <laughs> yeah, now if, I, if I could just jump in real quickly there, uh, Katina hit the nail on the head. When, when you take a, you want to take a degree in I don't care whether it's educational leadership or business leader. When the word leadership is in there, all the hairs on the back of my neck stand up because yeah. it is about it is about budgeting. In the yeah. end, it's how do you make your money get you recognized as being a leader? You know, I. Or the word excellence. That's the other way. That's another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent, I'm excellent leaders. Are like, okay, please save me. You know, I'm in. I'm in mortal danger now because I have excellent leaders around me. You know, and 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 this is this is the problem. There was a time, almost universally, where we considered education a common good. That's why we had public schools. They finally came up. This is all products of the Enlightenment, basically that that we, we went for universal education and everybody should learn things because, because you could become a more, I hate to say the word, you know, like a, a more productive participant in the society in which you found yourself. You were able to contribute and, 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 and to the prosperity and well-being of everyone around you. Well, we, we 86 that a long time ago. We, we threw that overboard. And we, we brought in we brought in not just the devil but also Beelzebub to help us out and one of them yeah and one and, and one of them was called technology and the other one was called business and and this is what I then saw in, in vocational education but this spreads in the sense um, there was a time they just instituted again after many many years a three three tiered degree system in Germany. Now you get bachelor's, master's, and and uh, doctorate degrees. When I when I studied at university back in the day, if you will, um, the first degree was a bachelor, uh, a master's, or a diploma. They didn't have bachelors anymore. Those had been eliminated about a hundred years before, which was a classical system. That's what uh, Oxford and Cambridge and all those folks did. They 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 maintained that, but. They brought those back in, and one of the things that was in the the law, the directives that you know filled it out from the EU was that the bachelor's degree had to be professionally qualifying, meaning it has to make you able to be able to get a job, and and that's when they they that's where they killed education from the business side, because being able to do a job, I've, I've I'm one of those people who I've had more jobs. The most people will ever dream of because, and I've never worked in a field I've been qualified for. Um, I never had a piece of paper that matched the job I was supposed to do, except for one when I tutored uh, strategy on an MBA program because you had to have an MBA to get in. Okay, good. So I, I punched my ticket and that was, that was that. So I've always been, I've always been kind of like, you know, an, in, an English teacher in engineering is not what you generally find. You know, so that kind of thing. But I have found that there's no job, and I've had many, that can't be learned 
by an intelligent chimpanzee with enough bananas. Because most of them are just simple, routine, rote, mindless, mind-numbing, if <laughs> not activities that we have to carry out day in and day out because our corporations and the most of our the processes, we love processes and all those things, we, we, we design them mechanically. You know, so, we, you know, that, all those metaphors about being, you know, the wheels and machine, Charlie Chaplin, you know, which is, the, you know, the classic film where the little guy just gets, you know, run through the wheel. That is corporate America. But that's not just corporate America. That's worldwide, global, whatever, corporate, whatever it is. And you just you get in there. You're the cog. You do this. And as long as long as we have this this mentality, as long as, you know, if I put it in Gabe's area terms, as long as we're in this rational consciousness structure, that is what we're going to have. You're never, ever, ever going to change education from the inside. That's not where it's going to happen. There has to be a change of mind before there can be a change of how we deal with our mind. That's why I agree with John. Meta perfection isn't integral. It's just taking a big of you saying, oh, this is, it's saying, well, it's not just fucked up. It's really fucked up. You know, that's what the meta perspective gives you. <laughs> it's just more screwed up than we thought it was. But, but we need to change that mind. As long as you're looking at it from a perspective, even if you know there are others, it doesn't help you because you haven't brought them together. You just know there are other perspectives. Well, that's very nice. And that's also very tolerant. And that's very welcoming. But it doesn't really help us in the end. That's why we need to go beyond this. I, I appreciate, you know, what, what Gidley's trying to do. And, but my initial reaction when I, when I, when I saw the, um, the diagram is, okay, here we got a four by four grid. <laughs> and there's three boxes in every grid. You know, it just, it just jumps out at you. I don't know how else you per depict it, you know. I'm sure her diagram is better than mine would ever be. But you get this immediate impression, oh, we can do these boxes. And you get this with Gidley because she's so into what she does. If you look at any one of her videos, you'd think that's the only thing she does. And you realize after seeing a whole range of them, you go, oh, she's always like that. People must have a tough time being around her because she must be really intense <laughs> because whatever it is she's doing, she's completely focused on. Now, that's that's an admirable characteristic if you can get the people that you're engaged with to go with you. But we have to change. And this is what uh, Marco had also brought up, if I can bring that in. These Raman bedingungen, the boundary conditions, these are the things, this is the basis of everything that happens that allows things to happen. And in, until we can change those, that's, that's really where you have to go. You have to go so deep within to do that. And most people that I know, even when they're well-intentioned, tend to approach that systematically. And the systems thinker says you can change a part of the system and the system will change. And I don't believe that. I've been in too many systems where you can change it all day. The system doesn't change. The system will just eventually grind you into the system and you will function in the system. So we need to, and this is why I like the Gapesarian systematic approach, you need to bring that in from the outside. I don't know how that's done. I just know that I, that I and this is where John and I think agree uh, very much, it's so damn hard to get to integral, you know, because I certainly don't think I'm there. So I don't know what the hell I think I'm going to be doing to you know, to shift this. But I, I do recognize that if we get our head above water, we're going to have trouble breathing soon. But it has to come from the outside. We're not going to do this from the inside. This change of mind, of course, this is the thing that's been going on for, all, you know, if you just, if you always think what you always thought, you always get what you always got. And, and, and that's what we do. You know? Well, I'd like to respond to um, something that um, I learned from Ed, actually, um, in a conversation that we had <laughs> was that a, a subtle double take there um um in one of our calls uh i was uh we were talking about gebser and uh lisa was uh presenting something and uh she talked about the the deficient integral and i corrected her and i said wait a minute according to, there, there is no such thing as a deficient integral we haven't gone through any efficient form of it yet and good gebserian that he is 
Ed came and corrected me. <laughs> and he said that Gebser had actually said, unlike the other structures where there's a, a where usually there's a tension between a deficient form of culture, which is rubbing against a new form of culture, and it gets amplified, the deficient form, until this new form of culture can take over in its efficient form. And then the same thing, process, that same uh, process continues with another structure, the tension between another structure that is emerging will uh, create an inflamed deficient form of the structure that's being transcended. So I think this ties in with uh, what uh, Steiner was talking about, the recapitulation, he said, of um, the culture that each of us uh, recursively recapitulates the efficient and deficient forms. He didn't say this exact language, Steiner, but he was talking about something very similar, I believe, to what uh, Gebser was saying. Um, and I think that uh, this, this can cause a lot of stress. I mean, each of us is recapitulating all the bullshit that has ever occurred in the history of humanity. That's a, a lot of bullshit out there. So we have to find if, and now I, if you're telling me that there, and I'm looking for this efficient form of integral to come in and rescue us, and Ed has disillusioned me. And he said, well, maybe we're getting an, a deficient form of integral along with the deficient form of the mental structure, which is a speculation, I think, uh, on Gebser's part. Um, and so I'm in this stressful situation because I believe that we're moving, we're moving from, I think we need to make a distinction between biological evolution, cultural evolution, and, and what some are calling civilizational evolution. We're doing all three at the same time. But there's, you know, cultural, I mean, there's a difference between biology and cell division and mitosis and all of that jazz and DNA and RNA and the interplay of environments and niches and what's happening in culture with the spear, the bow and arrow, the trap, you know, the, the slide rule, the, the computer that we're, we're working with right now and what's happening in civilizations as civilizations are, are clashing dramatically in our world now. So I was just looking at the, the, the dream I shared with you uh, it was personal. I think there's there's some transpersonal elements and there's stuff that's focused on exactly what we're doing today. Uh, working with the technology and the dark side of the technology and perhaps the, the efficient forms of this technology, which we are encouraging by our participation with that intention. Can we use this technology in a way that is efficient and promotes uh, this, these possibilities of, for uh, you know, a sustainable future from as many people as possible using our arts and our sciences and everything else, all the knowledge that we've acquired. And I believe that in that dream, there was that episode where I explored this uh, Vajrayana practice, a very ancient practice. I've been practicing it for about 20 years and I'm just starting to get some results. <laughs> so this is labor intensive. And, and then I have this group in this other dimension a fourth or fifth dimension, if you will, discussing this. And I say, no, no, no. there's some noise there. Okay. I'll be finished in just a second. I can't. There is a, I think, what I was, and I described to this group of people, I said, I talked about this practice, this ancient practice. I also mentioned past lives in China and in Japan. And then, and I right now do not remember any past life in China or Japan, but in that dimension, I did. And I think this is what Aurobindo is speaking to in the life divine, that the psychic being has access to everything that's ever happened to us and everything that's ever happened in any culture that we were a member of. But I don't think that the personal, that I personally can have access to that, my ego certainly doesn't. As I'm in this ego world with other egos, I don't have any direct access to that. But I think in other levels 
in other phases of consciousness, I might, I can. So, um, so I'm just using that as an example of technolo as an example of civilizational evolution. That there are m many more of us, I believe, that are starting to rub up against this, these uh, these clashes between civilizations, and remembering that we were in other civilizations besides the ones that we're in now, and other versions of of civilizations than the ones that we're in now. And I think that would be bringing the biological, the cultural, and the civilizational um, into, uh, dialogue is not the right word. It's a deep dive. And uh, I think we have to risk madness. You might just blow a fuse. <clears throat> but I think this is what's required of a certain portion of the population so that we can move out of this uh, late late stage uh, capitalism, um, you know, monetizing everything, including the air that we breathe. Anyway, that's my spiel. I believe there's, uh, I think, Aurobindo and Steiner and Wilbur, who's still very much alive, and uh, Gebser were brilliant, but they didn't have all the answers. And it's and we're going to have to we're going to have to fig figure this out on our own. I don't think there's any expert. Thank you. Can I just respond quickly to what, um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I wanted to respond to John because I remember John had said um, that, John, sort of like in the message you sent me, um, I was really struck by what you said about our, uh, our personal, like, you know, our human agency being, um, being you know, I think vulnerable and at, and at risk just right now. And it's not just from technology, but when I read a little bit into um, uh, the author, when she was writing about the characteristics of post-formal thinking, you know, sort of like going from picking up where uh, Piaget left off um, for the stages of development, I was looking at some of, when I was looking at the characteristics of post-formal thought, that really uh, alarmed me because, you know, it has all the characteristics of has all especially where there's no foundation because we haven't even like established with this particular generation and the generation maybe before or a little bit before that um, we haven't even really mastered the realm of formal thought formal reasoning and formal yeah formal thought um, then we're trying to say that we're going to be going and shifting gears into post formal thought um, and some of the characteristics. Uh, 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 I guess you'd say being able to handle multiple causality, multiple solutions, um, a higher awareness of relativism or, or rather than absolutism, um, or, or they possess more of an understanding of the relative, non-absolute nature of knowledge, right? Pragmatism, awareness of paradox, um, relativistic thinking, and being able to accept a contradiction, accept contradictions and to handle contradictions. But I'm saying that this post-formal thinking without a mastery of formal thinking and reasoning is really sort of like um, a way to justify stupidity and ignorance or a way to mask it, okay? Um, because, you know, yeah, especially when I see, when I see um, the lack of, 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 of educational development among the youth, not only in public school, like like everything, I've never taught on the college level, but um, I've tutored some college students, and I'm shocked at how much copying and pasting they do. You know, uh, they've asked me to edit papers, and I'm like, oh, this is very well copied and paste, copied and pasted. It's, I mean, even on that level, and I'm shocked at how lenient the professors are because they have to be aware of this. They have to be aware of the one thing I will say about the generation of people, of young people coming out of college and high school, is that they have been able to master um that like the disguise how, how to manipulate um manipulate certain resources put it together and present it um at an, at an acceptable level so it'll just like sort of pass but they really were not involved in it whatsoever like you know like i had a recent student that had to do on this long project okay and then when he gave me the last the, the written portion to look over you know 
he was barely even involved in in the project you know he just knew where to go to find the information to make it appear that way and just put it together and and present it so they're good at manipulating resources to make it appear as though they're involved but all this relativistic thinking and accepting contradictions all these characteristics of post formal thinking and reasoning is really a, a really great disguise for ignorance and stupidity you accept contradictions because you don't know how to identify one <laughs> you know um and relativistic thinking well yeah i mean that's what you know anything goes or what have you i mean you can accept relativistic thinking because you don't know how to identify or how to handle absolutes i mean so i'm i'm really afraid of us going in the direction like get was talking about of of developing post-formal reason and thinking when I don't really think we've mastered formal thinking and reasoning. I think that that's going to be, because I, I see that post-formal thinking being utilized now by young people as a way to manipulate um, and disguise their inadequacy. They're, they're sort of like, you know, they're, what do you call it, cognitive inadequacies. Um, and, and, you know, that I think that that poses a problem. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a good point and one I hadn't really reflected on too much or compared maybe the formal with the post-formal. Um, but I perhaps she, so the book, which maybe I'll get into a little bit now. Do we have enough time for it even? This might take 10 minutes or so. Um, we have about 20 minutes, I think. Okay. Or 25 um, minutes maybe. But essentially she wrote the book for educators um, as kind of a, a glimpse into what the John was talking about, the different evolutionary approaches. So if you take your average educator, they probably won't know too much about Gebser or Wilbur or Aurobindo Steiner, perhaps Steiner maybe, because he tends to side more with the educational field, um, just with his Waldorf School Association. But so she first wants to kind of explain that there's there's more than so the formal okay, let me just try to show it. It's going again. Uh, so she states right around here that the intent of the book is to show us how an educational integration of love and reverence with life-giving conceptual imagination and creative multimodal methods transmitted through an authentic human voice can lay a strong foundation for the emergence of post-formal reasoning later in life. Um, so this, this isn't necessarily going to neglect any formal education. Um, it's not going to throw the three-year-old into, here's 500 complex situations um, solve the global crisis right now type of thinking. Um, there will still be um, some, there needs to be structure, of course. Um, and then uh, I think you, maybe Tina, and maybe you, Marco mentioned that, or, or maybe it was Ed, that having this this kind of map this little mandala 12 this or that um it doesn't really do anything um even for me um just like wilbur's maps for anybody that's explored wilbur he, he it's the intellectual mapping out of other intellects perhaps and to see that on paper it might be good to as a summary like for me now i can look at that and say okay well this summarizes the book i can use it as a reference point but when it goes to educating my child, all this is not there. Um, I, I'm going to focus on what we're doing right in that moment, um, utilizing what I've learned. Um, but so she, she's really this, the love, life, wisdom, voice. It, she's trying to bring the human back into education. Um, the, the reverence for um, not only education in general, but uh, of I, I focused a bit ago on kind of 
sponsoring our elders, re resituating ourselves within that community. Um, you can be in a school setting with uh, 40 computer screens going on at once, still in dialogue or some sort of conversation with the teacher, but there's no community there. It's individual perspectives, just shooting off, summarizing, cutting and pasting, whatever it might be. Um, but there's no real, what, if, if that teacher said, hey, let's go step outside and sit in this adjacent park right here for 30 minutes and talk about what we would like to have happen in this course for the year. That's probably not happening in any university. Maybe it, some teacher might attempt it. Um, but to actually have that dialogue with the students, that's not happening, either grade level, wherever. It might happen in certain types of schools. Um, but we so going forth with her book, we've already mentioned that she's influenced by Steiner, Waldorf, Wilbur, Aurobindo, Getzer. She's also influenced by the postmodern um, scene with uh, Deleuze and Guattari, uh, their difference in repetition book, which is, I, I can't explain it, but um, it can be summarized as organized structure. So we, we see that those models and then creative flow. She, she leaves this model as open ended. She's not going to be founding an integral school for post future studies. Uh, anytime soon, um, because she's more focused on just getting this knowledge out there and right, um, just allowing us to be aware of what's out there. Um, so in part one, this is where she goes into the evolutionary approach to ed education. Um, chapter two, part, or chapter one was the introduction. Chapter two is cultural evolution, past, present, and future. Um, I don't know if that's too small there, but she's essentially comparing Gebser's structures, archaic, magic, mythical, mental, integral, with Steiner's macro history and Wilbur's synthesis as well. Um, don't necessarily have to read all these right now. I'm just uh, showing you. Um, but she's essentially taking these cultural evolutions, um, mapping them out, and Um, allowing us to be aware that um, there are these these levels. Um, it's really focused on Gep Gepser's um, eventually kind of right here. She's uh, noting the key features of integral consciousness, um, which we've talked about, um, which is the reintegration of the whole person. Um, just to name a couple of planetization of culture and consciousness. Um, linguistic self-reflection and the re-enlightening of the, the word. Um, but, uh, so she goes into that and chapter three goes in from the cultural to the individual development. Uh, this is the she, she compares Gebser with Piaget. Um, so his his developmental um, kind of formal reasoning, is that what it's called? Um, but he, she's comparing like, the sensorimodal of the infant with archaic. Um, from two to six years of age, um, the pre operational aligns with magical, concrete operations from seven to 12 aligns with mythic, uh, formal operations from 12 to 18 aligns with the logic becoming up abstract with. The mental rational mode, then, but PHJ doesn't really explore the integral consciousness. Um, so she notes limits to PHJ uh, yeah, and notes the deficient mental. Um, and so we need to enact a new thinking. She's saying that to, this is a lot of what our, our focus on, is on the PHJ model. Um, you have something like that, Doug? Um, uh, can, can I interrupt you, Doug? Yeah. You mentioned, because the charts are a little overwhelming for me. Right. Um, to, to be honest with you, I'm just, it's, I, I, I can go back and reread this. But you talked about love, life, wisdom, voice. Now, 
I'm not doing clean language, but if I were, especially with you, Doug, I would love, since you've studied this material and absorbed so much of it and made this excellent presentation today, I would like to go into to love, life, wisdom, voice. Is there anything else about voice? Where is that voice? Does voice have a size or shape? Now, to me, this is where we, these maps and these maps about maps, which Wilbur and, and Gidley are very good at, where's the territory? It's gonna require a deep dive. And I think we're not doing it just for you or for me. We're doing it for a lot of others. And there have to be enough people who are interested in the experiential rather than just having chat fests. And here's my map, here's your map, here's my map. You know, maps about maps about maps with no territories. I think this is a danger. And I think this is the deficient form of the mental. And I think I agree so much with what Tahin said about the, the post-formal and the formal. How can you go post-formal when the formal is so inadequate? and how a lot of our technology is promoting a stupidity and ignorance. And what do we wanna have happen when we're confronted by that? I think Katina has mentioned that she's, she has, a, has an agenda. And I believe that, that uh, the suggestion that we need to restructure our, our sense of agency in this new age where the community is physically absent as is today. You know, we're having a, we have a community here, but it's physically absent. How are we going to coordinate the evolutionary development that has allowed us these face-to-face -face communications that transmits culture is, is so disrupted? I think it's going to take extra special vigilance. And I'm just wanting to quote from these two authors, Aurobindo, no, not Aurobindo, but something that Steiner says and something that Gebser says about the voice, because this is what I'm most attracted to. Uh, and I believe I... I think you mentioned, Doug, that different people are going to be attracted to different clusters of capacities uh, around that wheel. And uh, he, she mentions that, I'm quoting Geb Gidley here, that Gebser says, no, that Steiner says, he says that he proposed that we need to develop a new language, which is not so bound to the sensory world, and which can discover the spirit of the language in all its living force. And he goes on to, she quotes him, the very words and turns of phrase in themselves take on something of a spiritual nature. They cease to be signs of what they usually signify and slip into the very form of the thing seen and then begin something like living intercourse with the spirit of the language. That comes from his essay, which I've not read, but I'm gonna look it up the spirit of the of language, uh, the spirit of the language. And, I, and then compare that to what Gebser says in Ever Present Origin. Every word is not only a concept of a fixed equivalent in writing, it is also an image and thus mythical, a sound and thus magic, a root and thus archaic, and thus by virtue of this root meaning still present from origin, our sense of hearing, our heart and our mind must be equally awake. So I think these are two, two masters, master scholar practitioners, um, and we can resonate in all of our readings that we're doing. We can go from the map making cognitive self to the somatic self, which is into rhythm and um, ambiguity and paradox and can handle it. And I think it's the, the map maker and the, the aspect of us that loves to take deep dives needs to get coordinated here. And I believe we can do it as we move. But I think the danger is that I think I'm thinking about what deficient integral could possibly mean when there's so few people who are even remotely integral. Um, and I, I get this idea that there's this, um, uh, it's not just about emergence, what emerges. It's also about emanation. And I believe that it's possible that you can emerge without emanating. And I think that's, that's the tension, I think, in, in that late stage, which we're none of us are close to cult civilization. There's no integral civilization yet. But I think that's a challenge because I think a lot of integralists are very fond of emergence. Um, that's the talk. I don't know if they can walk it, but they can certainly talk it. But I don't think that we're 
anywhere near wrapping our hearts and minds around emanation. Um, and that's the challenge for me when I enter into these zones, these subtle zones where there's nothing but emanation. It's everything is vibratory, everything is light. Contrast between light and dark. And um, how do you translate that into something in a worldly context? I found it almost impossible, except on a few occasions here when people have been generous enough with their attention to listen to something as, as weird as some of the experiences that I've tried to describe. So thanks all, thanks all. Uh, John, you have answered your question yourself. There were people who were willing to listen to you. Therefore, you could emanate something. There was in you something that could express itself, uh, that otherwise, when their context, the outer context, is also a very, if you wish, a very down-to-earth material thing, maybe, the outer context isn't right, then we cannot express ourselves. There is something now so that is blocked, is frustrated. If the outer context opens itself to this emanation, then we can emanate. And this is for me the basic education. That's what I tried to express previously with the word educere. We pull out something. Well, pulling is It may be a bit too strong word because it uh, may suggest something violent. That's not the case. But education should be not something where I induce, but where I educe. Uh, that's something that it's difficult <laughs> in our modern culture to put this into practice, into the da daily practice in schools, in universities, in whatever kind of educational context, where we have this instinctive idea that we must teach something, that we must tell the children, the students, what they must know. Whereas there's rarely, rarely this idea that we should allow them to discover by themselves what they can know or probably what they already know, but you have to pull this out. It's, this, this seems to be all very abstract because, as I said, there is a problem with uh, uh, the, the, the outer context, the, the, the boundary conditions. And as long as we will not solve this problem of the boundary conditions, these ideas are all very nice and or very, very right, but it will, won't lead us very far, I think, from the practical point of view. Can I respond to that, Marco, um, about pulling it out, you said, and about boundary conditions? Mm -hmm. And I have the question about pattern and pattern recognition. And supposedly, If I can recognize my patterns and you can recognize your patterns, we can recognize patterns in each other's patterns. Mm -hmm. And can we abstract those patterns in an ordered way? Or is it just, are we flying by the seat of our pants? And it's a sink or swim kind of dynamic. And I think that, I think you're pointing out something about boundary conditions. Because when you know the boundary conditions, when you know there's a cut, you can get on, you're on this side and you're on that side and you can go back and forth and then you can articulate differences that make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I believe, a different kind of yoga that I hope we're, we're both of us trying to, to make that territory more explicit. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. It's, 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 it's a dynamic play. Huh? It's a dynamic play also in the differences. I am as I am, you are as you are. And it is the, the second, the, one of the many difficulties is how to create, uh, how to shift these boundaries uh, so that 
I allow you to expand your boundary towards me, but at the same time without violating my essence. Okay, but this is now becomes a bit too abstract. I, I have many ideas how to explain this also with very practical uh, ideas, but this may be for <laughs> another right. another. Session. Well, I look forward to that on our forum. I hope you'll you'll share some of these possibilities with us. Yeah, Please sure. Do. Oh, or you could bring that up in another cafe in the future, where we could we could explore yep. that because exactly what you were talking about was the experience that I had at the boarding school. Mm -hmm. Because I had the, I lived in the same house with my family. We mm -hmm. were twenty four seven together. When you know, I was the one that got up at four o'clock in the morning because the kid from downstairs threw up on my bed. You know, mm -hmm. so and when there was, we had we had class and we had guilds and we had our activities. We all ate in the big dining hall at family tables and things like that. But there was no real boundaries between us. That, that's exactly what we were always doing. How far can I go? How far can I allow? How far do we interact? And it's this merging with others because even though we all individually have to learn, we're not individual independent learners. It never works without others. And and our our system as it's set up right now, this is why I like what you said. Well, we're actually there to educate. I think I think draw out is another meaning of educaro. Draw. Oh, yeah. yeah, draws are draws a better way. It's less, draw it's better, less yeah. uh, forceful. Okay. <laughs> if you, we can draw it out. Yeah. Um, that might be a good one. Um, that it's in under the current conditions that we have. We can't do that with the soul. If, if the system and if the environment that you're in doesn't acknowledge that such a thing as a divine being or a soul or a psychic being, whatever you want to call it, but every time you call it something, other people hear something else. And so if that's what we're doing, then we're in the wrong place. That means you, I, I come back to Doug here because, you know, he's our secret agent. You are a secret agent all the time. I was always trying to unfold people. I believe people have souls, so I was always trying to unfold their souls. But if anybody asked me what I was doing, I was just trying to do my job, you know. And your kid's making it damn difficult for me to do that, you know. And that was usually said to get the parents off my back because the kid was okay. The problem, the problem was sitting in my office, and it wasn't the kid. <laughs> so... Why don't you go home and visit him next month? <laughs> and I'll have a lot less problems in the time because, and, and it is in this, how, how do you get, to me, future teachers, all teachers are facilitators. I never thought I had anything to tell anybody. I don't know what I would know to tell anyone. But just interacting, whether it's, you know, dialogue, voicing, feeling, you know, it's an extremely personal, intensely emotional um, job teaching. Te you know, it's, it's a 100% it's a job. You just can't go in, and that's why I, I don't like public schools. Teachers, some, they don't even live in the districts that they teach in. So, uh, you don't know your kid. You don't even know what they're about. You have no idea what they have to encounter, you know. And if you don't, what do you, I don't know what you're doing. I know that, I know you think you're doing a good job and I know you're trying as hard as you can, but I have little sympathy with your, with your constant sense of failure because you're setting yourself up for it. And then when you get it, what, you're surprised. I learned about self-fulfilling prophecies in semester one in education, you know, <laughs> that was also about us. <laughs> we tend to, we tend to forget that. Yeah. So all of these things are true, and that's what I appreciate about what Gidley's trying to do. Put the big thing up there, and I'll pick things up. But we have to, we have to engage more. So at the beginning, since we're not going to change the system from the inside, we have to subvert it. And part of that subverting will bring that system down, too. We also have to realize that. So that's, that's part of the dangerous game that you play. But I, in the meantime, have become a firm believer that we learn in spite of school, not because of it. So it's, there are a lot of things that we do learn there that are going to help us later. Because <laughs> I had a lot of bosses. If I hadn't had teachers who are, gotcha, 
go ahead, do your thing. <laughs> I'm going because I know I'm going to do mine, and that's the only way that you can get through. So some of these ideas that you have, Mark, I would be really uh, interested in hearing about and exploring, at least kicking around. You know, you can always kick the tires, see if it's going to roll. You know, who knows what might come out of that. So yeah, okay, I can the next session maybe I can make a little list. Well, mm -hmm. we can discuss this. Yes. Yeah, you know, Doug is a good coach here. He could really share with you his uh, expertise and how you put one of these things together. I put together a couple of them and had a lot of fun. And I believe Katina may have some uh, surprises for us. I can take an article or an essay and, and develop some questions about it. There's a good template for this. So I would encourage everyone to manage it. No, I was just going to say that this definitely, um, wow, I, I still want to work work from the uh, the blueprint that Gizzy has, has provided because um, there's so much in, in it. She pretty much uh, outlines what we have to, what we need to be prepared for. And I believe that, you know, when, when Ed was talking about systems, I, I do believe that, you know, if, if, if you don't like the system, that, you know, if it's not working, I think that, you know, you create a new system. And I think that, you know, that people, individuals, communities coming together can do that. I remember uh, Douglas, my heart goes out to any parent who's vested in their child's education today, like Douglas was saying, uh, little ones. I mean, I, I almost advise parents, if they can, to homeschool. And, you know, and, and, uh, instead of public school, um, because it's uh you can develop like sort of uh little co-ops uh or groups within your communities uh and develop sort of like a homeschooling model but every single thing some of the things that marco and i heard john and ed and others all of you talking about that, that wow that would be a wonderful blueprint for a new system um it's the exact opposite of the direction that education is going in like we were talking about um, voice, you know, we're eliminating the voice, the human voice in, um, in, in education, and we're replacing it with, you know, digitized chat rooms, what have you. Um, and, and also, the, uh, Ed, you were talking about when you're like in the boarding house, teaching that environment, coming together and, you know, community. And Marco, you are saying about sort of overcoming some of those boundaries that we set up. In, in our space and in our ability in our in, in our ability to to connect with students um well we're replacing that with independent learners you know um that's like becoming we glorify we glorify independent learning now and we and we we credit technology with, with, with enabling us to become independent learners and i don't see how that's such a virtue um to think to think that oh you can learn without needing any any what you can do it on i don't you know there has to be like interaction and interdependence in that in that process in the education process. So I think it is possible to create a new system. I really do, um, and I would be interested to hear what more we have to say and what Gidley has to say because I think Gidley, like I said, I'm looking at to see she's giving me an idea of, of what to prepare for and what direction we're going in. And that direction, I don't see it as a very good direct. And, and she even says that some of this direction we're going into is she's cautioning us. In a way, um, so that's all I have to say. Um, okay. I have a little bit to say. Um, maybe I have a quote too from Gidley. Thank you. Katina. Thank you. See you, Katina. Um, but I feel like if I'm to go on the personal level here, I I'm not an educator. I'm not trained as an educator. Is what I mean. But my son and I and my family and everyone around me, um, we are all learning at the same time as we're moving about the world. Uh, this past weekend, uh, I've noted to some people that I, I joined a Quaker community last year. Um, not necessarily tied to any personal spiritual belief. But this community allows for, they're, they're tied with the Montessori school. Um, this past Saturday, they, my child got to experience um, hand-pressed apple cider making at somebody's farm. 
and um, interacted with courses and did all sorts of things that wasn't going to be a part of any school curriculum, maybe maybe a, a rare outing, uh, something like that. Uh, but what and I, I'm interested in the constant education of myself, uh, trickling that over to anyone here on this site, trickling that over to my son. I've noticed I, since having children, I, I want to help teach other children. Um, when normally I would just say, oh, that's just a kid doing his kid stuff. I'll, I'll maybe teach him how to sit at a table properly or just little basic things um, that I wouldn't normally do before I was a parent. But parenting, um, it's not necessary for everyone to be a parent to realize that the opportunity for education is there at any moment. Um, and there, there's all this concern about the futures of education, the future of our school system. I, I personally don't have any concern. I know that I'm going to do a good job with my son. Um, financially, I'm, I'm not there. I, I, I don't, won't be able to send him to the best and brightest, greatest schools there are. Uh, supposedly, I'm living in poverty, according to the, the sheet of paper that I would, would state my level of income. But uh, so if my wife is not working, we are a family living in poverty. That, that sounds horrible. But in reality, we are the most beautiful family you've ever seen at certain times. Uh, of course, we have our arguments or whatever. But the chance to educate is, is present at any time. And we don't need schools for that. Uh, we, we don't need teachers. We are all teachers. I'm, and this last quote I, I just happened to be uh, looking at here from Gidley uh, was one I flagged as what I see this, this uh, infinite conversations, this website, our interactions here as the technology for my son was missing. He did, but other than uh, being able to talk with me about this experience of um, pressing the apple side of the the pumice is what you call the, the apples after it goes through a grinder. And then you throw it into a bucket and you have to manually press the, the juice out. And it's hard work. Uh, so you can get a, a little sip of, of apple cider. Um, but other than telling me about that experience, he, um, he's not in school yet. If he was in school, he his, might mention it to his friends, but his teacher will not know about this experience. Um, so to continue education often means to be in continual dialogue, continuous dialogue with that. So I, I imagine this site, I imagine my son being in dialogue with Ed here, talking about his experience of pressing cider. And Ed would say, yes, in Germany, this still goes on, or um, I have that experience too. And it, it doesn't need to be a bunch of older white males, or it doesn't need to be the group of people we see here. We're missing on generations. Um, actually, I'll, I'll read a couple of things. Ed mentioned he likes the glass bead game. Um, and I found a poem in there I'd like to read. But uh, Gidley says, my interest has been to identify and begin to cohere the plurality, plurality of emerging educational approaches that appear to support one or more post-formal reasoning features and or themes in the evolution of consciousness literature by bringing them into dialogic relationship with each other. They can learn from each other, inspire each other, and give strength to each other. This is what I mean by evolving education. So that's ex essentially what everybody was just talking about there at the closing. Um, and wanted to read this poem earlier, but... Uh, so this is from the, the Glass Bead Game by Herman Hesse. Um, Ed noted that as one of his top five books. I, I was reminded of it, and I, I, I think I need to read it again because it, I think it, it might be exploring a lot of what we're talking about here. Um, perhaps it's prophetic in a certain way as well. Uh, but this poem's called Soap Bubbles. So essentially the character in the book wrote poems, and they, 
there, there. Not, not and, slow to Dikean bubbles, by the way. No, no, no. I, I, and I was wondering, that, that's another reason I, I wanted to mention this is uh, I don't think Slaughterdyke mentions essay at all. Um, he might have been influenced by, by this particular poem, but uh, he says, from years of study and of contemplation, an old man brews a work of clarity, a gay and involuted dissertation, discoursing on sweet wisdom playfully. An eager student bent on storming heights has delved in arch archives and in libraries but adds the touch of genius when he writes a first book full of deepest subtleties. A boy with bowl and straw sits and blows, filling with breath the bubbles from the bowl. Each praises like a hymn, and each one blows into the filmy beads he blows his soul. Old man, student, boy, all these three, out of the Maya foam of the universe, create illusions. None is better or worse, but in each of them, the light of eternity sees its reflection and burns more joyfully. I really like reflecting on that poem. That was beautiful. I loved your voice while you were reading that. It came through. Thank you. So, so with that, if uh, any final comments, that'll that'll be my my final comment there. But I, I, I hope like we continue this conversation as well in uh, the future. So, I I only have one 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 comment, Doug, because of something you said in America's fascination with elite universities. Um, we should never forget that George Bush had a bachelor's from Yale and an MBA from Harvard, and Donald Trump has his bachelor's from University of Pennsylvania. So, so much for elite schools. No comment. <laughs> I can't help myself sometimes. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, I, this has been a very nourishing conversation. I feel fabulous. Thank you all very much. I'm looking forward to the next one. Yeah. Good job, Doug. I, I really appreciate this. It was a very rewarding couple of hours. Yeah, and I know others have mentioned they wish to discuss in the future. Mm -hmm. so, so this can go into later. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Conversation or in the evening, um, not necessarily the Cosmos Cafe setting. So I, I think I, this I, is a thread we haven't really focused on like with yeah, Steiner. Thought, we haven't talked about. It. I wanted to talk about a, a potential cafe in the future, working around our uh, clean language work that we're doing, Doug mm -hmm. and uh, Michael, and working with the restructuring agency. So I'd like to like, I'm thinking about agency and mm -hmm. how many of us are stressed out and feeling that we're s sort of losing touch with that could possibly. I have, I have to go. So oh, that's you, Marco. Yeah. Okay. Nice having you here, Marco. Enjoy. Bye. Take care. Thanks, Marco. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Doug. So you can finish your comment, Don, if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to finish your sentence. <laughs> I've got a few more minutes. I do need to go. So I, I, I don't want. I know we're going a little bit over, so I don't want to keep anybody because uh, I know I tend to. Some people think I get a bit long-winded on occasion, um, but there's some. Uh, what I like about our conversations is we let people just let it unfold rather than having to cut and edit and paste in such a way that we get to the good parts as fast as possible, which I find is makes for really bad writing and really bad speaking. It's when we're trying to get to the good parts. Um, but I think the, I was thinking about, uh, Michael talked about uh, a, a need for safety and restructuring a sense of agency. That was a sort of desired outcome we worked with in our last session. And uh, we work with different things. Um, but I think that um, that's sort of being brought forward in, in a lot of the things that I'm curious about. How do we get a sense of agency when the, when the community is physically absent? And I believe that's happening more and more. We're not in a, in a rough house. We're not in, sitting at a table uh, at a food fight throwing things at each other, which would be a lot of fun. <laughs> we learn about our boundaries that way. 
and you know how to punctuate that with some more serious conversation and being able to slap someone on the back or punch them in the gut, whatever, you know, that's a physical uh, community. And we don't have much of that anymore. I see the young people are on their devices and they're ignoring the person right next to them. And if they turn to the person right next to them, do they tell them a story? No, they show them something on their device. And I'm, I'm that I find tragic because there's, where's the storytelling? Yeah. And um, anyway, that's my, and that sense of agency, I think that good storytelling helps us to, uh, to emanate. You know? yeah. So I would like to like focus on that in some future cafe and maybe I can get some assistance from you guys. And yeah, we can talk about it tomorrow. We meet tomorrow. Good. Right? good. We'll do some research and then we can make a report. I'd like to use these cafes for that purpose as sort of to report on mm. ongoing progress. And for those of us who can't be at those sessions, it's very helpful and informative to see what you're up to and what's going on because it, it provides, provides lots of food for thought for other things that flow in elsewhere. So that's great. Yeah. And you're, and you're a great observer, even mm. in stuff that you don't participate in directly, that you bring your observations to that mm. creates a participatory stance because that's a, a that creates a, an influence mm. very helpful okay so i'm finished yeah me too had fun work good, well see you next time guys okay good afternoon to you and good night for me <laughs> sweet <laughs> good night Ed.